The Penobscot First Nation peoples are indigenous to what is now Maritime Canada and Maine United States. Penobscot is also the name of their language, which is part of the Algonquian language family and is otherwise known as Eastern Abenaki. They used to occupy the entire stretch of land between Maritime Canada and Maine, but were separated by the border and now only a band government remains in the Maritimes. Those populations have now been permanently separated from their official reservations on Indian Island in Maine. The Penobscot First Nations were members of the Wabanaki Confederacy, which also involved the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and Abenaki First Nations. They formed this confederacy to defend themselves against the Iroquois, with whom they had a long-standing conflict as they were allies of the English. The Penobscot had a thriving culture and government before European contact occurred. To begin, the Penobscot nation is one of the longest continuously operating governments in the world, and their government has seen many significant governors through the years. A few examples are Joseph Arono, John Neptune, and Chief Thunder. The Penobscot social structure consisted of loose groupings of villages, each with their own chief or governor. Most often, the governor or chief was also a shaman in each village. The Penobscot lived in wigwams covered with birch bark, and their lifestyle was semi-nomadic. This is because their people traveled from their villages to hunt in the snow-covered forest during the winter and returned in the summer months to fish in the Penobscot River. They used their specialty birch bark canoes to do so and to travel through the water of the river in the summers. Another interesting practice of the Penobscots involves the way they prepared beans. They cooked them in maple syrup with pieces of meat, and the beans are baked in a hole in the ground, which gives them their name, bean hole beans. This was the signature cooking method of the Penobscots, but has been adopted into Western culture over the years since contact. Their pre-contact religion involved a couple important mythological figures. The Penobscots shared a belief in Midewiwin with many other Algonquian people, but this belief was altered by the arrival of the French, which led to a conversion to Christianity later on. Also, prior to the conversion, according to Penobscot mythology, Penobscot peoples believed that Tabaldak, the creator, made humans, followed by Gluskabe and Maslumis, who both had the power to create a good world, but only Gluskabe did so, and Maslumis still seeks evil now. Gluskabe created the Penobscot River, according to mythology, which makes him very important to the Penobscot First Nations, as that is their ancestral river. There's also a legend of a, the bird spirit Pamola, that causes the cold weather in the winters. According to the Penobscot people, this spirit lives on, a, on Mount Katahdin, which is their sacred mountain. These are all important aspects of their culture pre-contact, and though many of their common practices were preserved, thanks to great strength and effort from their people, colonization definitely had drastic effects on their religion and government moving forward. The colonization also resulted in the instigation of many, many wars that resulted in the loss of many Penobscot peoples as well as the loss of their land and many of their human rights. To start from the beginning, we must talk about Estavo Gomez, who was the first person to make contact with the Penobscots in 1525. Following that, David Ingram was the first to document a Penobscot chief, Chief Besabez, despite the fact that they'd had many great chiefs before him. Up until 1635, all settlement attempts had failed. Unfortunately, the French succeeded in building a settlement on the eastern shore of the Penobscot Bay called Fort Pentagoet. This failure to fight off settlements could be attributed to an event called the Great Dying, occurred between 1616 and 1619, and it involved the destruction of up to 90% of all Native American life due to the contraction of European diseases such as smallpox. It significantly decreased their numbers and weakened their defense efforts. The first settlements by the French in 1635 marked the beginning of a century filled with many violent wars, mainly between the two opposing European settlers, the French and the British, as well as their respective First Nations allies, the Wabanaki Confederacy and the Iroquois. There were four wars involving the Wabanaki Confederacy, who were allies with the French. These wars were in a series called the French and Indian Wars and included, in chronological order, the King William's War of 1688, the Queen Anne's War of 1702, the King George's War of 1744, and the Seven Years' War of 1754. All these wars were fought between the French and the Wabanaki against the English and the Iroquois. Following the 75-year period of wars, in 1796 there began a time of booming treaty agreements between members of the Wabanaki Confederacy, including the Penobscots, and Massachusetts and later with the state of Maine to define reservation lands. These treaty agreements will later come to benefit the members of the Wabanaki Confederacy, but until then, many legislative decisions will be made regarding the Penobscot First Nation. A few hundred years after the first treaty agreement is signed, in 1924, the Penobscot Indians become recognized as U.S. citizens, 
Following that, in 1954, they are given the right to vote in federal elections. Twelve years later, in 1967, they are given the right to vote in Maine state elections as well as local elections. 1967 is not very long ago, and up until that point, the Penobscot peoples weren't allowed to vote in state elections. This is something that is not very well documented and allows Canadians to ignore the guilt associated with othering an entire group of people. It took many, many years for this group of people to be recognized as fellow human beings, and through in-depth research, it becomes glaringly obvious how veiled this information is in terms of public accessibility. Hiding First Nations history only holds benefits for Canadians and settlers. It only further pushes the First Nation populations down, and the first step to reconciliation is to increase education and awareness of First Nations history and culture. The important privileges finally being awarded to the Penobscot peoples allowed them the autonomy to file the 1972 lawsuit for two-thirds of the state of Maine, claiming 12.5 million acres of land that was granted to them in the aforementioned treaties. In 1980, they reached a settlement for the Penobscot ceding their land in return for $81.5 million. This settlement will shape the future of the Penobscot First Nation. It allowed the Penobscots to keep their culture alive, despite the fact that many First Nations cultures were dying around them. The beginning of their comeback as a nation started with the founding of the high-stakes Indian bingo that opened up on their reservation. It was the first source of income for the Penobscots in a long time. Following the signing of the Maine Indian Land Claims Act on March 15, 1980, for which they were awarded $81.5 million, the Penobscots also became federally recognized, which means that the federal government now recognizes their group as a tribe. This gives them access to a range of federal services in education, social services, law enforcement, health services, and resource protection. The money won in the settlement allowed them to buy back most of their ancestral land, and they were able to establish businesses and create jobs to jumpstart their economy and allow them to rebuild their culture and lifestyles. The beginning of the 21st century saw the tribe thriving, and the Department of Cultural and Historical Preservation was created, which built an important foundation for Aboriginal education in Maine. They managed to keep their culture alive through a mixture of acculturation and resistance to assimilation. Following the buildup of the reservation and the creation of the Department of Cultural and Historical Preservation, they began to focus heavily on raising awareness and education on Penobscot culture. They recognized education as the most important tool to maintain their culture and traditional practices, as well as to maintain friendly relationships with the neighboring settlers. A banned government remains in Nova Scotia, but as I mentioned before, they are essentially landless because the only official Penobscot reservation is on Indian Island in Maine. After a time in the 19th century, when destruction of the Penobscot First Nation seemed imminent, the sharp turn towards success for the tribe has strengthened their reserve and pride in their culture. Their achievements have been great, and their goals of a cultural comeback through quality Indigenous education programs will hopefully be equally as successful. Yo, and oh no, oh and oh no, and oh no. Yo, and oh no, oh and oh no, and oh no. I'll bet you gwe, gwe, he own it. I'll bet you gwe, gwe, he own it. I'll bet you gwe, gwe, he own it. Quack, 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 quack,